Good morning, and thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here, and I'm really looking forward to spending time with you all to hear more about your work. And I'm thank you, thanking you for indulging me to talk about mine. Uh, I'm George Oates, and I've been a software designer for about uh, 20 years. And since about 2008, I've been working in the cultural heritage sector. Uh, thanks to Adrian, too, for inviting me to give you this talk this morning. I'd like to share some ideas around collections and audience and contemporary practice outside the cultural heritage sector and share some of my past work that might be of interest in these areas. Okay, so to begin. Um, I think just about all of our old venerable institutions contain collections that were made by collectors. And catalogues written by these random collectors are very definitely not standard. They're intense and beautiful and variegated. Uh, there's linguistic dynamics in pl at play and even hieroglyphics in some cases. One example is one of my favorite collectors who I've done a little bit of research about. Um, his name is Sir Hans Sloan and he's a prominent London figure and early physician who lived from 1660 to 1753 and actually lived at the building which now houses my office in Bloomsbury in London. And this is a page from one of his hundreds of catalogues which are now housed at the British Library. And this is a 50 page essay that analyzes and describes and reconstructs at a best guess the how and when and why he and his staff catalogued the way he did. This is one of his book catalogues. And interestingly, in the early days of his collecting, it seemed as if he was working to collect a whole medical bibliography, and his catalogues were more about acquisition price than anything about the books particularly. These original documents are now housed at the British Library. Another great essay on book collectors comes from Walter Benjamin, the noted German philosopher and eclectic thinker. His story, Unpacking My Library, about how collections come about and how collectors see themselves might not be the most rigorous of cataloguers. Um, he, he is certainly not the most rigor rigorous of cataloguers, as you can see here. As he says, for what else in this collection is this collection but a disorder to which habit has accommodated itself to such an extent that it can appear as order. So I'm wondering if a lot of our woes are governed by the fact that lots of our older collections are themselves made up of collections that were collected by collectors, each of which had their own motivations, areas of interest, and languages for description. So given this incredibly diverse set of resources over the years, many, many standards have emerged to try to corral the way people describe things into a small set of fixed categories. Some of this work is only done once and never looked at again. A lot of this work was done with paper and pen, or a typewriter, or a punch card, or often these days on a lumbering piece of software that's poorly designed and stuck on top of a legacy database. These various constraints and challenges have resulted in catalogers and other humans making tons of workarounds to make their data the way they want it. This is a diagram made in 2010 to encapsulate the various data standards out there in the world of metadata. I wonder what that would look like even today, just eight years later. Back then, it looked pretty, pretty variable, variegated. Lots of standards to choose from, as they say. This is the famous linked open data cloud. And I just wanted to uh, survey the audience quickly. How many of you have a node in this cloud? OK, I'd say maybe 10, 20%, something like that. Let's say 20. Cool. And some metadata has not made it into the linked open data cloud, like this handy note discovered at random in the bowels of the Welcome Collections art store. It says, in this box, folder numbers beginning with seven are numbered with video disc frame numbers. To find the catalog number, look up the seven number in the catalog, but don't enter the final I. Then look there for the catalog number, probably beginning with a numeral two. Damn humans. They're always needing to add their two cents to everything, eh? And now I'd like to jump forward to today, um, where collectors describe their online collections as they're created, 
using predefined web native data structures that often already connect to authoritative data sources like geolocation, for example, or even something as simple as using a standard date format. We all know what a nightmare old date fields are, right? There's never order in them. So here I'm trying to equate somebody who uses Pinterest or Flickr or Instagram as a cataloger and a, and a collector. I realize this might be a bit contentious, but it's only to start drawing a line between what happened before and what's happening now. There are also loads of metadata generated automatically in the creation of a born digital resource, which doesn't go to waste, like EXIF data about photographs taken with a digital camera, and that's, that data is stored natively on Flickr, for example. The other point to make about these contemporary web native systems is that they live in a permissions space, a, per a permissionless space for creativity, innovation, and free expression. There are billions of us using the web now and happily uploading our digital materials and describing them in varying levels of detail in languages from across the globe into databases made by all kinds of companies, some scarier than others, but that's for another talk. Uh, and actors and collectors organize things however they see fit, often with absolutely no need for consensus of any kind. And let me give you an example. The other day, my cousin James delivered my childhood Star Wars collection to me from Australia, where I grew up. Naturally, I set about arranging and rearranging the 80 or so figures into various classifications, which I now recall I did a lot as a child. Here's a pleasant arrangement uh, by dominant color. Here is a problematic one, which is by kind. There are robots, humans, and other. But I was wondering, I'd put this guy in the human section, but I wasn't 100% sure, so I asked Twitter. And Twitter wasn't sure either. But luckily, Wikipedia came to the rescue letting me know that apparently there's some kind of being called a sentient. So I suppose that's an other. Uh, we have collections, we all have collections of some kind, whether it be Star Wars figures or owls or books. But back to books. One of my favorite books about books is called The Library at Night by Alberto Mangel. I highly recommend reading it. He writes beautifully about the dynamism, order, and mystery of books and libraries. And it might be of inspiration to you as you explore the world of linked data and its accompanying rationalism. He says, a library is not only a place of both order and chaos, it is also the realm of chance. Books, even after they've been given a shelf and a number, retain a mobility of their own. So what I'd like to try to show is that our capacity to gather and reflect back this mobility is sadly lacking in most library metadata systems. It's concrete meets plastic. It's nobody's fault, but more that books have so many entry points that can't possibly be captured in a single system. You might think that's a great reason to try to link systems together where we can, and maybe it is. But the links and the structures are organic and dynamic and linguistic in nature, and that's something that it's difficult for computers, and us, frankly, to keep up with. After, let's say, about 50 years or so of computer systems storing library metadata, it's become dreadfully bloated. I think this is for three main reasons. The original source metadata was often created in the context of a specific collection, and therefore not especially conjoined or positioned in the aggregate. Two. When the transposition from paper to computer happened, it squished a lot of the color out of these catalogs and, its inf and their information. And three, because joyless tools and short time have meant that the richness of the materials is never reflected, reflected particularly well in its metadata. This means that digitally, both search and aggregation can be vacant and unsatisfying. And later I'll show a little bit about this sparseness and how I've seen it in various systems. Uh, born digital collections have internal integrity and are often designed for sharing and propagation. And when I say collections, I'm using that loosely here to mean things like all the photos on Flickr or pins on Pinterest or songs on Spotify. The service provider defines the data model and simply expects that everyone will use it. The interfaces are designed specifically for that system and its data 
and the, the makers think deeply about what's being described and try to help users do a good general job. You also have this newish idea of tags, which arguably radicalise our ability to give flexible descriptions to things. Since, let's say, 2003 or so, we've seen an explosion in descriptive metadata explode all over the web in endless languages from endless perspectives and growing all the time. But they're also incredibly rigorous. Indeed, people might die if people don't use these standards. Standards. I wanted to show you one I found. Um, have a look at what you can do with this simple, comprehensive shared data. This is a map of all the planes flying in the air at once. It's driven by something called the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast Standard. Uh, it's a surveillance technology in which an aircraft determines its position via satellite navigation and periodically broadcasts it, enabling it to be tracked. The information can be received by air traffic control ground stations as a replacement for secondary radar, as no interrogation signal is needed from the ground. It can also be received by other aircraft to provide situational awareness and allow self-separation. So that's the little device. Um, and there are just six fields that the plane needs to broadcast. A call sign, altitude, etc. And the planes in, receive, uh, in exchange receive the weather, terrain, uh, general information about uh, and traffic information. Maybe it's the threat of imminent destruction or a crash or something that's helpful for making something clear and short. Um, and the final and probably the most important introductory point I'd like to try to make is about audience. One thing being a designer teaches you is how to figure out who you're doing the work for. And having an actual audience can help you stay focused. Are you getting them what they need? And do they enjoy it? Um, I was reading the abstract for the talk and came across this phrase, harvesting agent, which I really like. <laughs> I was just wondering if any of you have actually met your harvesting agents. Um, I presume that's a program of some kind. But um, I think machines aren't exactly an audience. You know, they're just big calculators from a certain point of view. So I, I encourage you to ask, who is using your catalogue? Can you talk to them? Uh, it might be the person sitting right next to you at work. Do they enjoy their job? Are they happy with their tools? Maybe I am a harvesting agent. And to help you do this, to help you understand who you're doing this work for, um, uh, every goal that you set needs some way to be measured, needs a metric. You do all this work to make your data attractive to machines. Do they like it? Where's it being consumed? Do you also consume data from other institutions? Or are we only really aggregating it for now? Why do you want to link your data? How will you know if you've done it well? OK. So I'd like to show you some of my previous work that I think bridges this gap between catalog management and contemporary practice. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I used to work at Flickr when it was first started. Um, and if you look at it today, it contains billions of objects, billions of photos and video, um, and millions of people use, use the thing. Um, I just wanted to talk to, to you a little bit about um, the sort of participation and classification that surrounded this system and how it might be a little bit different from library classification systems. So I think one of the crucial th points about Flickr was that we set a default when people uploaded photographs to make them public. If we had set them to be private, the system would have been entirely different. So by default, people's photographs were out there to be looked at by others. I think this is s such an important design decision when you're considering software, is what, what you make your defaults, how you set them. Photos are good to look at, I'm not going to lie. They're an easy object to describe in some ways, um, arguably simpler than a book. Photos are good to look at, to point at, to annotate, to spread out on a table, to reminisce with, to discuss. And in the Flickr's case, the publisher of the content was often the photographer too. So the metadata creators were participants in the system. It became a social act to describe your photos in certain ways. Also, when they talk about Web 2.0, um, a lot of people sort of say, oh, that was the social web. But to me, the more interesting element of the Web 2.0 stuff was 
that there was a live database on the internet. You know, it wasn't just sort of static web pages being shown around. There were people changing data, reading and writing. And the other design decision we made very early on was to make it as easy as possible for people to share photos and get them out of Flickr. And in the early days, that was, you know, a nice interface to send an email to your mum or post a photo to a blog. Uh, but that led to, you know, designing one of the first um, publicly available APIs, for example. Uh, so, you know, get the photos out of the system from day one. In terms of classification, I think it was also pretty radical because it was completely uncontrolled. We never, not once, said you should tag this photo with this. Um, and over time, as the, the collection grew, what we found was that the structure just emerged organically. Um, it would, we, for example, we were able to start clustering photographs together um, that distinguished types of things based on the proximity of concepts and other key words around those concepts. Like, for example, this tag, which is uh, for peace. And here you can see there are sort of four types of peace that Flickr recognises based on the sort of concurrent keywords. Actually, I had to pinch this screenshot from a book called Visual Information Communication, which was published in 2009, because now that I don't work there anymore, they've killed the clusters feature, unfortunately. Or well, at least it's not available for public view. So now when I go back to Flickr, I have to be calm, because it's changed a lot. Um, but yeah, um, th there was a real presence and a real uh, joy in these sort of sociolinguistic and consensual descriptions that happened. And I wanted to give you one of my favourite examples, which is from um, a photograph taken in Paris in March of 2006, um, when uh, there were some riots, as there often are in Paris. Uh, but here's a list of the tags that were added to this photo. And I've, I'll just highlight the ones that these ones were the ones by the photographer Hugh, more or less. But over time, as the, f the photograph got attention, all these other sorts of tags started to be added. And <clears throat> these com the community added tags that had evolved to indicate popularity, like, for example, top-f400, which means that it's had more than 400 people favorite it. And incidentally, Hugh, the photographer, gave up his investment banking job to become a photojournalist. Um, we also have multilingual descriptions uh, that happened just right off the cuff. Uh, it was a full moon recently, so I thought I'd give you a full moon example. But over time, people also wanted to introduce a little bit more structure to this purely folksonomic thing. So we introduced this concept of machine tags. Um, this is me talking at um, South by Southwest in 2012 or thereabouts, 2011, about um, the need to introduce machine tags. And that's basically just a key value um, equals something, uh, a key value pair. And here's an example of how people are using it. So um, taxonom taxonomy colon kingdom equals animalia. <clears throat> so even with this, even, uh, you know, after this free flowing and um, uncontrolled tagging, people still uh, found a way to introduce their own little structures. But even those machine tags are folksonomic in nature. Um, towards the end of my tenure at Flickr, I, introduced, I, I developed a program there called the Flickr Commons, um, which uh, launched in 2008 with the uh, Library of Congress as its first partner. Um, it was designed as a way to help public institutions share their photographs in a public setting. Um, for, and uh, we also introduced the assertion on Flickr of no known copyright restrictions. Um, and working with the Library of Congress about that, I sort of realised that it's probably a challenge for lots of institutions, if they're not quite sure of the provenance of their stuff, to be able to say, we, we're pretty sure there's no known copyright restrictions, so we're going to go for it, and if one pops up, we'll take it back. Uh, but anyway, I, I also wanted to give you a, a, a glimpse at some of the uh, linguistic and, and uh, dynamic nature of classification that happened there. So um, the Smithsonian Institution was, I think, the third or fourth partner to join. And this is the, the tag cloud uh, snapshot I took in, back in 2008 about it. Um, and the tag Smithsonian Institution was the only one ha added officially, and the rest um, were added by normal humans. Um, so just as a very simple example, this is a photograph called Mailing Letters by an unknown photographer. 
and the description says, a young boy does his best to put his letters into a Do Remus style mailbox. Mailboxes of this type designed by Willard D. Do Remus were not very strong. The lip covering the letter slot could too easily break, letting rain, or in this case, snow, into the mailbox. And of course, we got lots of sort of cheesy comments from people, like, oh, they're so cute, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. But then every now and again, you get this bam, where somebody says, oh, uh, actually, uh, you can go and have a look at the patents if you want, and they're here and here, and you know, um, some real sort of um, handy research. And of course, something like 40 tags have been added. As another example, the description informs us in this photograph that the bust of Henry Tanner in the corner of the studio was given to the Met. And then the Met itself uh, pops by to direct us to their catalogue catalog record for that bust, which is here. And we can just do a sort of quick comparison. Um, this is another photo from the Smithsonian, which is posted to the Commons. And you can see there's a list of Smithsonian keywords that are the official presence on si.edu. And on Flickr, a whole bunch of others were added. And I personally had to correct a typo at that time, because I, I hate typos, so I was happy that I could fix it. Uh, but also, there's, there's a little bit of crossover between the normal humans and the officials. There's also a bunch of entities introduced in there, some, some people um, and other stuff. But so what we, ha what we saw at the Commons, and still do actually to this day, is um, passionate catalogers who are unafraid with plenty of time on their hands and um, willing and interested to give, give help. We're also seeing real new information gathered and importantly from, with multiple points of entry being created about these assets. Um, and in some cases, which I'm very proud of, the information that's generated on Flickr is put back into the catalogues. Um, so the Library of Congress has made updates to its official pho photograph catalogue um, based on input from the Commons. Okay, uh, the next project I wanted to briefly describe is about big library data. Um, this was uh, my next job at the Internet Archive, where I was um, the leader of the Open Library Project. And um, I tried to apply some of what I'd learned at Flickr to the design of this system. So it's a wiki editable library catalog, or a Wikipedia for books, some people like to say. It was made by the Internet Archive and it launched in 2007. It provides uh, over a million free ebooks, so if you're looking for something to read, that's a great place to start. Um, it gathered library records from the Library of Congress, Amazon, any and all libraries that had scanned a book through the Internet Archive's book scanning program, and we think about uh, over 50 professional sources, um, plus original records that were created by normal humans in the website. So that's a, a big melange of cataloging practices, required fields, standards, etc. Um, and it's, it was full of errors and inconsistencies. Um, the, the records that uh, were made by open, within the open library interface itself were pretty good because we designed an interface to get exactly the information that we wanted and controlled them to a certain degree. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you're adding a keyword, there was a chance to sort of use a keyword that already existed. Um, we also deployed the standard Ferber in 2011. Does everybody know what Ferber is? Yep, cool. So that was pretty hard with really messy data, um, turns out. Even just uh, having two editions of the same book, but with different author names, the computers go, uh, uh, I can't do that. Um, so we built some tools to improve the internal consistency of the data, um, which I'll show you one of in a second. We also, in the design of the system, tried to show the activity, because there are lots of edits being made all the time, both by computers and also humans. We developed a number of bots that were doing tiny and precise edits. Um, and we, I also designed the API so it could be hit using lots of different identifiers for books from across different systems. So here's an example of the mess. And I'm sure you've all seen mess like this. Let's not be embarrassed. Let's just get it on the table. <laughs> so this is Mark Twain, of course. But he's also called all kinds of other stuff. Here's some of the vari variants. Uh, my, fa my favorite, I think, is Twain, comma, Mark, in brackets, spirit. How does the spirit write a book, you might ask? But that's not important right now. 
Um, so we, we built a user interface, so on a web page, to help people merge all those authors together. And we kept all the alternate representations and we asked the users to select what they thought should be the primary representations. So we didn't throw away any data, we just kept all of these as alternates. So they could still be searched on, you know, everything was indexed, but in terms of the display, we, we asked the people to just pick one that they thought was good. And you can see here, this is a, an example of a recent activity page. This is the author page on Open Library about Mark Twain. So actually, I think our author data is holding together pretty well on Open Library. So if you're looking for um, good places to get authors, and all their alternate names for that matter, you might want to look at Open Library. Um, as I mentioned, we also developed a whole bunch of bots to try and do little, really, um, really intricate and specific tasks. For example, we developed OCLC bot, uh, and that updated millions of open library records to add OCLC numbers which matched on ISBN. Of course, ISBN isn't uh, robust for any books written before about 1970, and sometimes there are duplicates, but that's not important right now. Uh, but we, we updated loads and loads of records to hook directly to OCLC. Um, the other thing I worked on really, really hard was to try to gather identifiers. You know, everybody has their own canonical identifier for something, so why not just gather them all? Um, why not just let people access the Open Library API using a, an identifier that they know about? For example, the Goodreads system. Um, it's a web service about reviewing books and, and gathering lists of stuff and telling people what you think. So you can hit the Open Library API with that Goodreads ID and get back all the data that way, or a cover or that kind of thing. Um, and my friend Ben actually made a bot that update, updated thousands of Open Library records with Goodreads IDs, and they matched on ISBN too. And what that let us do in exchange was show a little widget on Open Library that said, you know, this book has been rated four stars, or whatever. So, uh, over the past three years or so, I've been developing a design practice which I like to call spelunking. And uh, that's an American word for cave diving and exploring. Uh, I think our digital experience of cultural materials from libraries, archives, and museums is massively search-centric. And that's actively inhibiting us for, from exploring these things in a digital space. So a spelunker is a web-based interface that we make at Good Form and Spectacle to explore existing individual data sets and structures quickly. It has no search, and it encourages you to click around following paths of interest to you. I'd like to show you a couple of spelunkers we've made, Two Way Street and our work with Welcome Library. And in particular, the Welcome Library work starts to poke at that um, ability to show the data curators their own data and have them reflect upon it. So Two Way Street, um, even though this is about museum objects, I think maybe it's still of interest. I hope it's still of interest for sure. So this was a, um, made in 2015. Um, it's an independent project, so we weren't paid to do this work. Um, it manages about 2.2 million catalog records um, that were originally written in RDF. We made it with three people, including me, and we built it in a week. So when you explore the British Museum, this is the entry point to the amazing British Museum. There's like eight million things in there and all you get is this. What do you want to look for? Well, I don't know what I want to look for. I'm not sure. Well, here's how you use the search box. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's the British Museum. <laughs> That's the entry point. It's just, it's terrible. So boring. Uh, so, little did they know that we found this directory on the internet somewhere. <laughs> which had a bunch of data in it. And we downloaded the biggest one, because why not? <coughs> and we made a website, which we called Two Way Street. And I just wanted to show you what you can do adding an interface to a whole bunch of data using some visualization techniques and just the basic backbones of the web's web, like, you know, hyperlinks, um, to let people explore. So, this is one of the visualizations on the website, and this, this uh, reframes itself to represent any list of things that you're looking at at any one time. This is the top level, so each square represents a decade since the museum opened, and the, the squares are graded by the amount of acquisitions that happened in that year. So actually, you can see they acquired the most things in the 1980s. 
Turns out it was a, an enormous currency collection from a UK government department. Who knew? Or you can scope it to show uh, when the acquisitions for 988 things from the Venetian school happened. Or the 85,000 or so things about classical deities were acquired. Seems like that's a consistently popular subject. We can also show for each chart um, who the things were acquired from. And there's loads of stories in here about the British Museum, uh, loads. I've learned a lot about diplomacy in the empire and it's, it's pretty, basically the British Museum is built on blood and bones, let's face it. But now we've got this amazing collection. Um, <laughs> Um, these are all the facets of the data, and you can see there, there's a little visualization in here too. So the blacker the word, the more objects have that facet attached to them. You can click on any of these, for example, where something was made, or where it was found, excuse me, and then you're just looking at a list of stuff. You can see there's also dodgy data in here from the v British Museum. Um, <laughs> We didn't actually try to correct or manipulate or merge or blend or do anything to the data at all. Part of what I want to do with these spelunkers is just show what's there in all its, in all its glory. And just, you know, let's not worry if there's too many errors in the data. Because it's still fun. And it's still entertaining that the British Museum doesn't know where something was found. Um, you can explore uh, creation techniques. Uh, another visualization when you're looking at a list of things, for example, the 22 things that depict Hamburg. Um, we, again, we have our little uh, um, acquisition history filter, but we also have a visualization that's designed to show you proportionally what kinds of materials and um, other facets associated with that, with that list of things. Um, here's a, a Gothic uh, cathedral that had been destroyed and made in about 1814, memory serves. We also show all the facets of the data there, so you can just explore, you can just bounce around. If any of those things take your interest, you can just look at it, and then you're looking at another list of stuff. Uh, or there's this list of things published in Hamburg, like this gem. I don't know if anybody can read and even translate the title, anyone? Endliches Schicksal? What does that mean? Destiny. Final destiny, yeah. <laughs> Apparently that work was owned by Napoleon I. Ooh, what else did Napoleon I have that he gave to the British Museum? <laughs> All kinds of stuff, turns out. Including this guy. I think Napoleon I actually collected a whole bunch of propaganda that was about him. You know, to sort of get it out of the world. You know, where do you buy all the New York Times if there's a bad review of your show? <laughs> I think it was a bit like that. <laughs> But importantly too, on two-way street, we also showed the, we were also really explicit about the stuff that we didn't know. So this is, on any of the item pages, we also showed the facets that were empty. Uh, you can also click through on these to keep moving around, um, but we thought it was important just to be really explicit about the fact that we were just operating with data that we hadn't changed in any way. And also in all of these spelunkers, there's always a .json endpoint that you can just go to and grab all the data. It's easily indexable as well because it's whole hyperlinked. It's, it's like the old school sitemaps in that way and you can just search for stuff on Google. But a couple of points about making this. So as your harvesting agent, um, the RDF hairball was really hard for us to consume. It was massive, but it was even harder for us to sort of find its edges. In fact, it was impossible. Um, we just couldn't do it, we were about to give up, until we found a single field in the massive hairball that was just an array of key value pairs, these facets that I, uh, you can see the site had been built around. So we actually got rid of all of the RDF, I'm sorry, British Museum, and we just used this really simple data. And we were able to construct this pretty fun um, explorer. Um, so that's just a note for the, for the um, creators of giant RDF hairballs, you know, try and let a normal human operate it and see if they can, and if they can't, maybe you could simplify it in some way. We also used a technology called Elasticsearch, a bit like a data store. I don't know if anybody's done that, um, but it's really good for making kind of, um, uh, getting counts for lists of stuff. Um, 
and it's really quick to sort of uh, populate with a bunch of data. So if you're, if you're interested, I would recommend giving it a shot. As I mentioned, we also built pages that could be consumed by machines. And importantly, we also linked back to the RDF. So if you were really interested to try to um, navigate the hairball, you could go for it. And coming back to you know, every goal needing a metric, we also put Google Analytics on the system. And you know, a website we've basically done zero publicity about gets this kind of traffic, which we're super happy with. And it comes from all over the place. Um, and I've gotten emails from people asking if I'd like to buy their nice object <laughs> or if I could help them with further information to which I reply, please contact the British Museum. Um, but because it's all indexed and searchable, um, people are finding stuff from all over the place. Okay, the second project is with the Welcome Library, also based in London. Um, this is a project we made in 2016, commissioned by the institution who are happily in the position to do this kind of commission. We are operating with about a million records, which were a blend of um, mark, but also sort of archival narrative style stuff. We built it in with three people, and the project was structured in four one-week sprints. Uh, we also reached out onto the rest of the internet and connected to some linked data sources, like VIAF, a Library of Congress, subject headings, uh, and others. Um, these were the sprints. So week one was about showing, well, what, what have we got in this catalog? How, how does it, um, you know, what does it contain? The second thing was about, well, how quickly can we get somebody to be looking at the actual thing instead of bouncing around um, bad search pages and so forth? The third week was about um, a much more human uh, piece of work, which was working directly with the um, editors and curators of the collection uh, and we literally hand-built an HTML page, which I'll show you in a second, about a single person in the, in the collection, James Gilray. And the fourth week was trying to bring all of this together and see if we could make it an entertaining uh, browsing experience by integrating with a few other different data sources very surgically. So I'll quickly whiz through this too. Um, so this is another visualization. It's a, a, of about a million records. And each rectangle you see along that horizontal line represents one of possible 184 mark fields used in the data. And the rectangle is shaded by how often there's a value of any kind in that field. We built this very simple visualization that expanded on that view, where you can see each mark field being listed on the left, and we show proportionally how often it's used in the data. You can also sort that by how often it's used in the data. And you can see there that there's actually only about four fields that are used in this data set of a million records about 100% of the time. And that's a bit tricky to read, but um, they're often kind of data-y, um, nerdy fields. But you can click on any one mark field, for example, main entry, personal name. Then you can go in and you can see um, what values are in those fields or subfields. So this one in particular you can see is really variegated um, we could map, you know, if there are things used commonly, we would map them as a graph on there, but personal name is not very, um, you know, it's not repeated often across the data. But you can also see this field is used about 50% of the time. And you can click through any of those personal, uh, personal names, like if I click through Daniel Defoe, then I'm looking at a visualization where each uh, row in that map is one record in the data. So you can sort of see that a lot of times these records have real pattern, but sometimes there's records that are really different from the other ones. And this, is a, this was a really interesting visualization to show to the catalogers at Wellcome because, um, well, for a start, they'd never seen a, an aggregate view of their data like this because a lot of catalogers' work appears to be sort of search, retrieve, modify, save kind of work. And it's very rare that they get to see the whole situation. Um, we're also fantasizing that you might actually be able to recognize human operators in this kind of visualization eventually. Like if, if George liked to catalog in certain ways or really like this subfield, she would always fill that in. But if Tom was like, no, no, I don't care about that subfield, I really like this one. You know, so we might, you know, maybe there's some kind of DNA print. Um, this is an example of 
two values in the same field, um, separated by a mere capital V. You can see it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. But yeah, it was really cool to show this to the, to the folks who made the data. Um, but still, you know, this data within one data set was replete with all kinds of gnarly variation, as I'm sure you are all familiar. This is one of my favorite summary in English. <laughs> this edition is in English and an undetermined language with English subtitles. It's awesome. <laughs> I just love this stuff. I don't know why you'd want to get rid of it. Then the week two, we were showing the thing. Um, we were trying to show trends in the data. We were trying to show the overall landscape, the shape of it. Um, this is a simple map of uh, subjects over time. And you can see the little white crests on the, on the right hand side there. That shows the proportion of digitized materials within that year of publishing. So again, you could just click on any one year, for example, 1893. Then you could see the percentage of stuff that was digitized. And then you could click on 1893. Again, you could see all the facets there scoped to the year. So apparently they were writing a lot about eyes in 1893, or at least the collection has a lot of stuff about eyes from 1893. And then you can have a look at eyes. And then you can have a look at books. Watch out, there are some really gross images of, uh, medical images of eyes, I'm just saying. Um, you can also click back to week one and view that record. And so then you can begin to sort of um, navigate the metadata space or you can open up the super awesome AAAF viewer that Welcome uses to start looking at big pictures of eyes. You can also show a very simple ordered list, which I love, uh, that shows you immediately the, the guts or the backbones of collections. Um, week three was that, uh, I think my favorite week, because this is where we really went deep on a single entity in the data. Uh, this is James Gilray. He was an English caricaturist and printmaker famous for his etched political and social satires, mainly published around 1800. That was when sort of the medical practice was emerging in London. So you can only imagine all the quacks um, that were happening in the, in the city at the same time. He made prints like this. That's gout. Isn't that great? Anyway, um, here's the handcrafted page. That's an engram thingy from Google. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, people were really unhealthy, I think, at this, point, this time in our human history. There's lots of, you know, being forced to vomit and, you know, leeches and stuff. Oh, gentle emetic, that's the word for vomit. <laughs> and that was also a hand picked list of um links into other catalogues. So I let that whole thing play because it's a bloody long page, um, but it's really fun to read. And as we showed people, um, they thought it was just going to be a list of stuff until they saw the editorial. Um, and again, just like we did in Open Library, what happens if you collect these canonical IDs? <clears throat> so the struggle that I think a lot of data creators are facing is the fact that they've got all this metadata but only a very small percentage of it they know to be popular or they know to be used. And that's the sort of content that they pay attention to and describe and maybe make sort of learning resources around or added interpretation or perhaps an exhibition. But then there's all this other stuff that's really thin. 
um, and often has sort of vast tracts of pretty bad metadata that doesn't really help anybody find anything. Um, so in week four, we tried to bring it all together by linking into these other systems to enhance the records that we had. For example, uh, we linked to VIAF and Wikipedia to produce our people entities. Um, and actually, the day that we added all these pictures, it was immediately obvious when this was done that the catalog is basically full of old white guys. Uh, we uh, supplemented the people, per, a person page with Wikipedia data and a bunch of other IDs and that kind of stuff. I won't play this because I'm running out of time. Again, we published the raw data at, at some endpoint that was easy to guess, like .json at the end of the URL. We had a subject page. I won't play this either. You can go and have a look. Um, one thing that might be of interest, though, is um, this sort of often seen with or go more specific. So instead of just a faceted search, you can actually sort of come back out of the search you were in or go deeper. That was quite nice. But um, I want to sort of round up now, sort of ending with a challenge for you. Um, you know, what, what can we learn from the practices of these web native systems that have been, built, been being built for about the last 15 years or so? Um, they're born digital, there's active participants, there's live data, and the data structure's done. Um, is there a way that we can adopt some of these practices in library land? And I wanted to sort of point to uh, a maybe a, a stretch goal on that. Um, look at this system. It's called uh, If This Then That. Has anybody heard of IFT? Yeah, it's really cool. It lets you, um, it's a tool to connect two web services together. And if it, one event happens in one, it triggers a response in the other. And there's all kinds of web services that are part of this system. Like you can post your Instagram photos to WordPress. You can be told if your mum sends something to somewhere. You know, it's all about events and transactions. And I think this kind of dynamism and interconnectivity might be something to sort of aspire to for library land. Um, how can we avoid copying errors and bloat, moving them around? You know, what, I mean, Linked, uh, linked data has so much promise, doesn't it? But it's uh, like we found on the sort of choking on the British Museum's RDF hairball, it's really hard to process somebody else's worldview, um, and it, whether that's expressed in metadata or not. Um, so what I'm wondering is what are the, like, do we really need to pass this field from welcome around um, a temporary note that will disappear at some point, which is basically just a bunch of OCLC references? Does that need to go in the linked open data cloud? Don't think so. Um, I never thought I'd say this, but I actually enjoyed reading a report that came out of the OCLC Research Libraries Group. Um, uh, and what they did was sort of survey across WorldCat, which has a billion, bazillion, million records in it. They did a similar survey to the one that we did at Wellcome, where they looked for mark tag, a mark field usage across the whole of WorldCat. And this table here um, is uh, the top 10 fields occurring in 20% or more WorldCat records. So my one of my proposals to you, and there are many, is is it worth doing a similar um, analysis on your own metadata to see what kinds of fields you use the most and wh which fields you never use or very rarely use? Um, maybe sort of is there a way that you might be able to publish just five fields from your data set? Could you jettison some or most of it, at least for use by other people? Like, how complete is your data? Uh, is it thin in places? And what fields could go? I wonder. What's the smallest version of your metadata that you could pass around? What's the path of least resistance? Um, talking about the path of least resistance, this was my favorite discovery in the linked open data cloud. Um, as I was poking around, it's the folding chair club. Um, you can bet this chap didn't download or adopt any library standards to jump into the cloud. I suspect he might have used schema.org to describe a few dates, something like that. Basically, you get a folding chair and come to the weekly meetings, bring someone else and something to drink. There is no restriction. And I did check and see if there's one at Hamburg tonight, but there's not one in Hamburg tonight. Because <laughs> I think it would have been really funny if we all went without folding chairs in the beer. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really curious to hear from you about the idea of tiny ontologies. 
and surgical updates. Like I know some of you are doing little bits and pieces or you're working out ontologies between small groups of people, but I maybe don't start with sort of sector-wide agreement. You know, maybe there's two collections that you could work very quickly and closely to join. Maybe it's also a useful concept to use internally. Like I don't think I've met a single institution in 10 years that doesn't have a special extra database about something else hidden away in the system somewhere. So maybe folding that inside internally might be, might be good. Um, and I've also read a lot that um, when, you, when you participate in the linked open data cloud, what you're doing is making things available. And I think that's really a passive position to take, even though you're doing a lot of work to describe your metadata in the way that machines can consume it. Just sitting back and making it available is really different to actively connecting to a catalog that you think will benefit from that specific collection, uh, connection. So I just, I would urge you to sort of just reframe the way that you're uh, thinking about this stuff. Um, and I wanna hear, again, I would love to hear more about the work that you're doing in this kind of zone. Um, uh, yeah, because all things are delicately interconnected. So what tiny things could you agree on with a, with a single partner? How could you start very, very small? But also, who are you starting this for? I think that's an important question. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to end by saying um, I'm going to be do I would like to try and do a breakout session this afternoon. Um, if this has piqued interest from any of you, I would love to hear from you. You can also come and tell me why I'm wrong, and this is a stupid idea if you want to. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, super keen to hear about your work and would love to, to know more. So thank you for your time and indulging me. I uh, look forward to talking to you. Thanks. Thank you very much for this great talk. You're welcome. Um, yes, questions, uh, ideas, suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> no questions is fine. Hi, um, I have a question related to the last part. So the those reports you made on, on you make on data quality. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you think it's easier for you to do that because you are an external and either you took the data without talking to the institution and you did that, like showing the empty fields or really showing the the, the errors, mm -hmm. or in the case of welcome, so they had commissioned you to do it. But I'm wondering what what will it take for institutions to, to do that themselves? Because I'm working for Europeana, so we aggregate data from other institutions. And in the work on data quality, I feel there is this tension of people not really happy when we point out um, quality errors, or even we, we had this idea of doing something similar, like showing uh, the completeness of the data, etc. But we can feel, as soon as you said, oh, we will make that public, the institution are a bit reluctant. So I'm wondering what will it take for us to just to look at things, not, um, yeah, not as guilty people, but just yeah. trying to do that in a, um, yeah, for this to be useful and proactive. So I'm just wondering if you had experience with that kind of behavior and how we could just um, look at things in a different way. Mm -hmm, certainly. Yeah, I've experienced that kind of hesitation from professionals who, whose data it is quite a lot. They're really, and understandably so, it's like airing your dirty laundry if, you, if your data has errors in it. So I can certainly see that point of view. But, you know, in the case of the Welcome Project, um, I think we found like maybe 40 fields in the data that didn't have a title. So um, Branwen, one of the catalogers, went and added titles to those 40 records, you know. Um, maybe it was because she was embarrassed that there were no titles, I don't know. Um, I think certainly my, my position and the company's position on the periphery of institutions is valuable because I can just sort of bounce in like a Labrador asking dumb questions and then do something really meaningful, <laughs> you know. Um, but maybe a suggestion for you would be to uh, try a small private project that you don't necessarily make public, but you, you just sort of show to your boss or, you know, um, some of the catalogues you work with. Because you guys are dealing with like, what, 50 million things or something like that. I mean, it's a huge data set, so of course there's going to be problems with it, errors in it. Um, 
I mean, my my position is that that's the status quo, you know. Um, so we should all just move on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would suggest. I mean, of course, you can hire me, but you can also just do, you know, maybe just do something small and private, just to demonstrate what what it is that you're trying to get across. And that I would start there. One of the things I regret not being able to build at Flickr was some kind of lexicon. So. Um, and I wanted to call it Flexicon, just because that was cool. But, um, you know, it would be um, uh, a graph that you could traverse that was about interconnectedness of words. So just like we were able to form clusters based on um, annotations and tags, you know, can we represent that in some way that's consumable by other people? Like, I don't know if one of you smarties could build that now, but, you know, um, I don't even know how many tags there are in that system anymore. Um, but I think you can also apply that sort of idea of dynamic classification to any of the big web systems now. Um, it's not something I've been able to follow in mm. projects because now the data sets I'm dealing with are all static and it's just about you know building an explorer. But I'd love to pick it up if anybody's interested in that. Uh, this might not be a question per se, but what really struck a chord with me when you mentioned um, towards the beginning of your talk, you mentioned joyless tools and short time. And um, I, I was wondering if you've got an opinion on um, why are we still working with uh, joyless tools? Because cataloging, somebody's got to do it, it's really a slog. Why aren't we developing better tools to, to make that easier, to make that enjoyable in a sense? Yeah. Um... I think a um, technological infrastructure is often done internally, like the IT department will manage the servers and whatnot. But, um, you know, software is often outsourced, especially in bigger institutions, I think. And paying, you know, let's not lie, so tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to some company in California to, you know, provide you a tool that's not designed for your data. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to prove with my little business is what you can do if you've got people who know how to build software under the roof. Um, and uh, it might take a little while, but um, institutions around the world are starting to have this kind, these kinds of teams who can you know, build software tools at the time quickly that you need. Um, so I think it's a matter for institutions to see these kinds of folks as indispensable as catalogers, the finance folks, you know, the cleaners. <laughs> it's, I think it takes a resourcing change to sort of start hiring tool builders under the roof. Um, and I think there's all kinds of cases to be made there about efficiency and time saving and money spending. You know, if you can say, you know, George the cataloger, who's A, angry because she has to use a crappy tool, and B, takes one minute to edit a record instead of 10 seconds or whatever. You know, I think there's all kinds of arguments to be made about efficiency and, and happiness. Um, but yeah, I think it's a broadly a resourcing change that's needed. And that, I mean, that comes back to how much can institutions pay people? And, you know, software folks are in the privileged position of getting paid a lot still. So there's a, you know, there's a, a, a gap to bridge there. Maybe that's some, somewhere where um, federal funding could support, or I don't know what the answer is, but getting more software people under the roof is my, one of my missions. Okay, thank you. One last question. Just wanted to ask, is this market visualizer available somewhere? It would be interesting just to sh pull our data through it and see what comes out of it. Yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Um, well, we built it in a week, so it's not really, I don't even know whether it would work uh, if you threw another data set at it. Um, but why don't we chat afterwards and we can see. I mean, I literally don't know. Uh, not even sure if the code would still run, but you know, could share it maybe. Yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.